Hello, and welcome to the Centre for Anaesthesia student podcast series. In this podcast, we're going to be discussing the basics of intensive care, also known as ICU. After watching this podcast, you should know all about the basics of ICU, including how ICU is different from a general ward, the criteria for admission, the common conditions requiring ICU care, specialised equipment, specific organ support in ICU, and the discharge criteria from the ICU ward. So what is the ICU? In most hospitals there are different levels of care depending on the amount of support and treatment offered on each ward. This podcast focuses on the highest level the intensive care unit, also known as the critical care unit or the intensive therapy unit. This is a specialised ward in hospitals that provide continuous treatment and monitoring of critically ill and unstable patients. The main purposes of ICU are to treat patients with serious or life-threatening illnesses, to support failing organ systems and prevent secondary injury, and to provide a highly specialised environment with a higher level of care than the normal ward. Intensive care different. The intensive care is different from normal wards in several respects. Firstly, there are specialised nurses, doctors and other staff there. On a normal ward, many patients are cared by one nurse or one doctor, but on the intensive care, there are higher numbers of doctors and usually one to one nurse per patient. Secondly, there is specialised equipment to support and measure patients' organ functions. For example, invasive blood pressure called arterial lines, continuous ECG, temperature and other parameters are measured. Of course, on the intensive care, the morbidity and mortality, so the chance of dying or having complications, rises. As more organs fail, patients are less likely to leave intensive care. Patients who have three or more uh, organ failures may only have a 20 to 30% survival. Lastly, the cost of intensive care is more expensive than ward care because of the specialised staffing, equipment, investigations. Who gets to go to intensive care? It's based on the ability of the patient to recover from their acute organ failure, their acute deterioration. Patients need to have an organ failure where there's a reasonable chance of recovery. There are two types of admission emergency and elective. Emergency admissions, for example, after emergency surgery or after some acute physiological deterioration such as asthma or pneumonia. These patients are often sicker, much more vulnerable and have a lower chance of survival. Elective or planned admissions occur usually after major surgery. These patients will have a higher Uh, level of monitoring and support after surgery. This slide shows some of the emergency triggers in the various systems respiratory, cardiovascular, renal, nervous, metabolic and general that are often triggers for doctors referring patients to intensive care. For example, if the respiratory rate is low or too high or the patient is not having enough oxygen in their blood, i.e. desaturating. What happens then is they will usually call an outreach nurse or call the intensive care itself, whose personnel will come and visit the patient, support the patient at the time, and then decide if it's appropriate the patient should come to intensive care. What sort of situations are patients in when they require intensive care? One, co- one condition called ARDS, Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome, which is a pulmonary inflammation, shown here with a chest radiograph, chest x-ray, 
requires intensive care. Another condition called sepsis, which is the systemic inflammatory response syndrome to infection. Sepsis is diagnosed by abnormalities in temperature, respiratory rate, heart rate and white cell count. One of the basic ideas about treating sepsis is that patients receive a care bundle, which is a, a group of treatments. The Surviving Sepsis Campaign is one of those examples of a care bundle designed to improve the treatment of septic patients. Finally, acute renal failure, acute kidney failure, is the sudden cessation or reduction in renal kidney function, which can be characterized by anuria or lack of urine production. All of these conditions will require ITU, medical equipment, assistance and monitoring. We use a lot of equipment in intensive care. Firstly, the monitor. The, mon the monitor records and measures the physiological parameters that we see in the patient. The alarms on the monitor alert the nurse or doctor at the bedside to any particular derangements in the function. The ventilator, if the patient is ventilated, blows air in to the patient. Patients usually have intravenous catheters to give the drugs, treatment, fluid, or even nutrition to the patient. Some patients have chest drains in. Most patients have urine catheters to hourly measure the urine output. Some patients have nasogastric tubes on suction and we often suction the airway to remove secretions. Respiratory failure is the inability of patients to breathe adequately on their own. These patients have hypoxemia and or raised levels of carbon dioxide because of ventilatory failure. Patients with respiratory failure often are ventilated on a machine called ventilator. Usually they are intubated first, that is a tube called an endotracheal tube is inserted through their mouth, through the vocal cords into the trachea when they're unconscious. They're then attached to a ventilator. The ventilator is a machine that assists the patient breathing by moving oxygen enriched air in and out of the lungs. It can be used at different levels. For example, patients who are profoundly unconscious and cannot trigger their own breathing are on special modes. Whereas patients who are waking up and are in a recovery mode can be on modes called pressure support where they can trigger their own breathing. Cardiovascular failure is defined as the body's inability to generate adequate blood flow to perfuse vital organs. The key equation here is that mean or average blood pressure equals the cardiac output times the systemic vascular resistance. There can be two reasons therefore why the blood pressure is low. Firstly, the cardiac output may be low. The cardiac output is a combination of the stroke volume and the heart rate. For example, if the patient's in complete heart block and the heart rate is low, or the stroke volume is low, for example, because of damage to the myocardium, which reduces the stroke volume. The systemic vascular resistance can be low broadly for two pathological reasons, sepsis and anaphylaxis. In sepsis, there's inappropriate vasodilatation. If there is inadequate blood flow carrying oxygen, to the organs. This can lead to inadequate oxygen levels in those organs, for example, the kidney, the brain, the liver, the gut. These organ failures themselves may need support and special treatments. Renal failure, also known as kidney failure, is the inability of the kidneys to excrete waste and maintain the electrolyte balance within the blood and tissues. Reduced urine output, also known as oliguria or anuria, is commonly used as a diagnostic indicator. Urine tests can show whether kidneys are excreting abnormal levels of protein and glucose.
Blood markers help to determine whether kidney function is normal by measuring the levels of urea, creatinine and dissolved salts. An increase in blood markers can indicate renal failure as the kidney fails to remove these from the body. By using renal replacement therapy, such as haemofiltration, the kidney's function in physiological homeostasis is taken over by the machine. The haemofilter machine works by removing the blood from a large vein which is then circulated and filtered before being returned to the patient. Neurological failure occurs when the brain suffers a severe injury and stops functioning properly. Brain injury can lead to a reduced level of consciousness caused by trauma, infection, stroke or for metabolic reasons. Bleeding into or around the brain or lack of oxygen can cause a patient to go into a coma. In the intensive care, staff concentrate on preventing a secondary injury to the brain after the initial insult. This usually involves minimising swelling to the brain and ensuring an adequate blood supply with good oxygenation. The patient will be constantly monitored with a bedside monitor and in extreme cases where the staff suspects brain swelling, there is direct monitoring of the intracranial pressure, also known as the ICP. If a low level of consciousness persists, the patient is usually ventilated, as displayed in the picture. Discharge from the intensive care. If the treatment administered to the patient is successful, they will begin to recover from their organ dysfunction. The specialised equipment supporting their organs will gradually be withdrawn until the patient can manage independently. At this point, the patient may be transferred out of the intensive care into the high dependency unit or onto a medical or surgical ward. The speed of recovery generally depends on the severity of the condition, the number of dysfunctional organs and the pre-existing level of health and fitness. However, intensive care may cause enormous physical, psychological and emotional strains on the patient and some common recovery problems include failure of the organ to function independently, critical care muscle weakness and depression, delirium and anxiety which may lead to post-traumatic stress disorder in severe cases. In conclusion, intensive care exists to provide a high level of care and support to patients with life-threatening illnesses and organ dysfunction. There are many differences between intensive care and the normal ward. On ICU, organs which are failing can be supported until the patient is stabilised and begins to respond to treatment. Here are the sources that were used in this podcast. And here are the photos that were used in this podcast. With contribution by Dr. Rob Stevens, Dr. Roxanne Jappi, and Dr. Amy Stead. This podcast is by Joy Ching and Jenny Choi.